Hello. This has been amazing so far. I truly amazing. I I was very nervous over the night trying to think what I could tell you in the next 10 minutes. I kind of tried to look at what people said before me and maybe just steal some ideas from them. I wrote some notes. Maybe I should say that I always thought that you should not ask students to declare a major, but ask them to decide what their mission is. And then this way on career day, maybe a philosopher would show up to recruit them. And then everyone can be a Texa, Kali, Hacker, Synthetic Biologist and other short things at the end of a sentence. And I thought I spoke fast. Well, I was supposed to see you on Thursday, but I missed my flight. And if you know me, you know that this is not something that happens rarely. One out of five flights I miss. Um, <laughs> in fact, uh, in, in fact, my, my uh, kind of more uh, telling story of missing flights happened a few years ago when I was still working in a job that you know was very kind of demanding. And one day, uh, I was in the office after a very long night of. We were working the entire uh, night, and then just before uh, I was going to go home, my boss tells me, we need you to fly straight to Italy tonight, because you're going to spend 24 hours there, and then you're going to fly from Italy back over Israel, where I started, uh, to Hong Kong. So you're going to just fly west, and then fly east again, and we have to do it right now. So before I knew what was going on, I, I packed a little carry-on and ran to the airport. This is the time where you still get paper tickets. I got a paper ticket and I uh, boarded the plane and very tired, I kind of get the first row and I put my carry-on and fall asleep right away. And I fall asleep for the entire flight and I woke up uh, just when we landed, kind of from the shock of the, of the, the, the landing and took my carry-on and left the, the uh, plane just to get a cab and you know, look at my itinerary and tell the guy, take me to the Hilton Hotel. And you know, he didn't speak English that well, I didn't speak Italian that well. So kind of Hilton is pretty international, so he knew where he's taking me. But other than that, I didn't know anything about, about Rome. So I tried to make a conversation and ask him something about the place. And I say, you know, what, what is there to do in Rome? I have 24 hours, and I say, well, in Rome, you should definitely go see the Colosseum and the Vatican, and he kind of gives me a little bit of like broken English answers to what I should see, and then ask him, uh, what's the weather? And he says, well, uh, I mean, the weather in Rome is pretty much always the same, so you should kind of wear a t-shirt and a jacket, and I do that, and we kind of somehow figure out how to navigate the conversation for about 20 minutes until we get to the hotel. And then he drops me at the hotel. It's early in the morning, like 4 a.m. or something like this. I get in. And I go to the receptionist and I say, hi, my name is Moan Surf. And she looks at the, the kind of entry and she said, sorry, sir, we, we don't have an entry for you. And I also don't have any room, so I'm sorry. I said, this makes no sense. I, the, you know, the company just booked a flight tonight, but I'm pretty sure it's there, maybe under my company name. And she looks at the company name and she says, no, I'm sorry, I just cannot see any of that. And I'm kind of getting nervous. And I said, but you know what? I have a printout of the itinerary, so I have the confirmation number. And I give it to her. And she types the numbers and she then kind of looks pale and she says, sir, uh, your reservation is for Hilton home. And I said, oh my God, this is not Hilton. I told him Hilton, she said, no, no, it's, it's Hilton, but it's not Rome, you're in Malta. Uh, the, plane had a, <laughs> the plane had a layover, in a di stop in a different country. And I just took off and just took a cab and went to the city. And now everything made sense when I, when I asked the guy, when I told the guy, like, what is that doing in Rome? He said, in Rome, you should go to the Colosseum. And I said, like, what, what, what's the weather like in Rome? The weather in Rome, it's at 20 degrees. Like, he, he, kept, like, he kept thinking, how weird is this? This guy keeps asking me a question about Rome. So, um, so uh, from, the, from the hotel, she called the airport, and she says, uh, you know, at the airport, they basically were in kind of DEFCON 5, because an Israeli guy traveling by himself with a little suitcase disappears on the plane. <laughs> So they said, they, you know, they kind of stop all the planes, and, and she calls and says, well, I have Mr. Surf with me in the city. And they said, well, I guess send him back. So you know, I, I get sent back, and within one hour from the moment we landed, I was already on the same plane taking off uh, normally. I just put, you know, came back, put my suitcase, took off one, more, one hour more flight. So, so, so I'm no stranger to, uh, to this kind of uh, missing things on time. <laughs> um, so so, so I, I've been uh, uh, involved with PopTech for the last four years pretty much in every uh, way you can do it. So I spoke here in 2012, and then in 2013 I spoke to the fellows, and then last year I did the PopTech road trip, and, and this year I was asked to tell you a story. So, so I was asked by Lita to tell you a story last night, and, and generally I have a rule that whatever Lita asks me, I do. I have like a thing when, when, when she calls me, it says yes. Instead of her name, it says yes, because I always say yes to whatever she asks me. So I immediately said, sure, I'm going to tell a story. I, I can think of a story uh, that's kind of play on the theme of hybrid. 
Uh, but I actually spent the entire night thinking of, of, of something because I figured out that everyone pretty much covered everything you can be a hybrid of in the last two days. Actually, there was kind of a thing. Everyone goes on stage and explains first how they are a hybrid somehow. So we had a Pooh and Rich, a horse and a donkey. David Dredger spoke about being in the past and the present, sick and healthy, synthetic and organic. So I felt that pretty much this is kind of covered. There's almost like the only one I could think of that no one spoke of was this quantum conundrum of being dead and alive at the same time. But that's pretty much like, you know, the cat and I felt this is pretty much how to cover. Uh, uh, but but I, I did see that, uh, that there's also a theme that everyone shares. And the theme is that even though everyone uh, thinks of themselves as very unique and different, there's one thing that everyone shares, and that is uh, the color code. So apparently, uh, a color code happens at, at PopTech. Everyone uh, is required to wear black if they uh, speak on stage here. Uh, so I try to play, be on theme and make sure I also uh, wear black even underneath. I even saw that uh, this is a random selection. I even saw that uh, if you uh, give a talk and you show cartoon images, they are also uh, in black. Uh, um, <laughs> so you really, like, uh, people really made, made an effort. Uh, in, in fact, I saw that Andrew Hessel, he used it, the icons in his talk were also in black. So people really tried to kind of play on this theme. No one told you in advance to do that, it's just like a choice. And uh, so I felt I should maybe try to tackle the one missing component, which is the effect of uh, being dead and alive at the same time. So I actually was a nominee uh, for the Ig Nobel Award uh, almost now 12 years ago. So some of you seem to know what it is. If you don't know the Ig Nobel, so in October, beginning of the month, they announce like every day the Nobel Prize winners, and that's a respected award that all of you probably know of. But a few weeks before, they announced the Ig Nobel, and the Ig stands for Ig Nobel, Ignorance Award, which is given to scientists who do real research on a serious topic and submit it to serious journals and it gets reviewed seriously, only that the topic itself is ridiculous. So just to give you an idea, a, a, a group at MIT won the award a few years ago for studying the five seconds rule. So finally they know that if you drop a food on the floor and you pick it up within five seconds, it actually is as contaminated as it was uh, even if it was on the ground for one second. And uh, another group of uh, people uh, uh, studied, uh, this is the, uh, the Nobel Prize in Medicine, that they, they figured out that, uh, you know that humans, if, if I start yawning, then it's kind of contagious and you start yawning and it kind of propagates. Turns out this doesn't happen in turtles. So turtles don't have this, <laughs> this, uh, this thing. If one turtle starts yawning, no, there's no problem. It's, it's the, so, so you can see why I'm pretty proud of, of this nominee. And, uh, and I, I almost got the award for, for a pretty grave uh, event in my life that started unbeknownst to me one Saturday night when I got an, uh, a phone call. This is pre-emails. I got a phone call from a robot. And this machine tells me that uh, they're telling me that the SAT test I'm about to take is canceled. That's surprising. I had a stay SAT in two weeks, and I'm kind of surprised by that, but I didn't pay attention. I figured I'm going to call them in the morning and see what's going on. And then the morning after, on Sunday, I went downstairs to pick the mail, and instead of having the usual five or four or five, five letters that I expected to have, I had 40 or 50 letters, and they're all addressed to my family, so they're all real letters, not just like junk mail. So I'm kind of still not paying full attention to that, but kind of seeing that something is strange. And then other strange things started to happen, but none of them by itself was enough to justify me feeling that something is not okay, until I went to the bank. So sometime in the afternoon I went to the bank, this is again the beginning of the year 2000, so you still go to the bank to get money. And I go and I stand in line, and I get to the cashier, to the teller, to, to get, get money, and I give this person my ATM card, and he looks at the computer and he types things, and then again, it's a theme in my life, he also starts looking very pale and concerned, <laughs> and, and, and he says, just a second, sir, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come back in a second. He takes my card and he disappears in the back room. And then he comes back after a few uh, minutes with the manager who says, can you step with me to the other room? I need to talk to you about something. And he texts me and he says, I'm sorry, we cannot give you uh, any money because uh, you're dead. <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. Uh, um, now, now I know where you stand on that. Uh, um, and I said, well, this is ridiculous. Clearly I'm alive. And, and, and the, the guy says, I don't know what to say, but the computer says that you're dead, so I cannot give you any money because you're dead, and you have, to, you have to kind of figure out what it is. And then everything started making sense because all the phone calls had to do with me not being alive. And that's why things got canceled on me and that a lot of letters came. And I was kind of you know, surprised by what's going on with, with, with my life. You know, I, I, knew that, I knew that people uh, have 
come back to life like Paul McCartney did, Elvis did, Jesus did. So I knew that there was some hope, <laughs> but, but, but not, not that many. And I, I, I wasn't really uh, excited about this idea. So, so, so I tried to investigate, and, and it took me a few uh, hours to actually figure out what, what was the problem. So at the time, I was working as a hacker. I was working in a security company. We were doing what we called uh, penetration testing which was, uh, it sounds kinky, but it's actually, uh, 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 we were just trying to break into banks and financial institutions and try to find flaws in their security to show them how they can secure themselves better from the real bad guys. And at the time, we were working for the Israeli equivalent of the uh, social security services. You see where it's going. So, so uh, we were trying to break into the system, break into the database, and see if we can actually uh, change records and do things in the heart of the country's in databases. And we did a great job. So it took us one day to basically get everything we wanted inside and we could delete records, change records. And normally what we do is when we get inside, we try to kind of make a little video that demonstrates how it's done so we can help them know what to do. So I assigned one of my team members to do that. So I went home, I told him just, just you know, make a video. So he went into the database and he wanted to show that he can actually change some things in the database. And he said, oh, I'm gonna take one record of someone and just change them. So he took my record, and every record in the database has your first name, last name, age, date of birth, uh, uh, occupation sometimes, gender, race. It also has a flag that's either zero or one, saying if you're dead or alive. So he changed my, changed my uh, zero to being dead to, to one being dead, and from then on I was dead. And what happens <laughs> is that uh, this system actually uh, propagates into every system in the country. So all the banks, all the insurance companies, everyone uh, bows from this system. And, and even though it's a pretty easy flag to change back, no one ever thought about the fact that people might come back to life. <laughs> so no system actually checks it after you, after you declare dead, it's just fixed. So from then on, I was dead in pretty much every system. So the banks, insurance companies, and, and I found it a little bit amusing for a few days, but you know, my parents started getting tombstones offers. I don't know how they know, an insurance company started like uh, offering us all kinds of deals on like uh, transferring my money. I did get all my traffic tickets canceled, so there's, there's that. <laughs> Uh, I also, I also uh, uh, remember that uh, I, I think there was a policeman who stopped me at some point and he, you know, he was not equipped to deal with zombies. He was kind of uh, nervous about that, like entire experience where he sees that I'm dead but he also sees me. Uh, the newspaper made an article about this experience titled The Life and Death and Life Again of uh, Mohan Surf where they asked me to give advice on how to deal with zombies in, in the world. <laughs> And uh, altogether, uh, once, you know, I think that once my girlfriend at the time started to try to claim widow uh, compensation, that's when I felt like uh, it's time to, to figure a way to fix that. And I actually tried to fix that by calling, you know, the, 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 the department that was in charge and saying, okay, I, I wanna be alive again, I'm done with this joke. And they said, well, we have no idea how to do that. There's no chance. The only way to do that is to go to the government and have basically a judge rule that you can create another entry for you in the database. So that's kind of how they did it. They created another uh, doppelganger for me. So now there's actually two of us, one that's dead and one that's alive, uh, uh, walking between, uh, between uh, all of us. And uh, I wasn't always like a, a tech person. I, I, I pride myself of, of the fact that even though I'm working as a hacker sometimes, I still like to have you know, a Blackberry and I still like to have you know, all those kind of old gadgets, Polaroid camera. I still like, like old technology as like a retro thing. So, Maybe this other guy, uh, uh, you know, is kind of making all the headlines still being alive, uh, whereas the, the whereas, sorry, I'm alive and he's uh, the one kind of getting to be dead. Uh, but I do know that uh, a few months after, we got a call from the Ig Nobel Committee and they said that uh, this wasn't just a joke for everyone. It turns out that there's, a place, there's countries, mostly in India, where people actually declare their family members dead as a way to get their land, and it's really hard to come back to life there. So uh, there was one person who had the same experience. His cousin declared him dead and took all his properties, and he spent a lot of time fighting the government, trying to come back to life, and, and failed. Uh, uh, it, not, it wasn't as easy, so he kind of created a, a community for all the living dead and uh, uh, out there, calling them for action. And when he saw the article about uh, my dead but uh, he kind of said, oh, finally we have someone in the West, of the Western world who can join us. So he uh, kind of called for action and, and he was the guy to win the Ig Nobel that year for uh, the Peace Prize, for uh, creating this fi finally a community for living dead. So I felt this is a, a, a hybrid version of myself and if you want to know more, you can find me on MySpace. Thank you. <laughs>